The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. The dialogue on this show should not be considered as medical, psychiatric, or professional advice and is delivered only as personal opinions from the host, co-host, and guest. KHLT Recovery Broadcasting is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, the Monty Man. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the second Speaker Monday uh, for the for the year 2015 here in January. Uh, I, I hope that you're having a good week. Hey, listen, uh, Speaker Monday this week is sponsored by Therapia Addiction Healing Centers. Are you a family member of someone who is struggling with addiction? Well, though this is not a pleasant truth to hear, you are suffering as well. Well, Therapy Addiction Healing Center offers a family program that is designed to help family members learn about the family disease of addiction and begin on their own path to emotional healing. The kind folks at Therapia work with family members while their loved one is in treatment and continuing care. Their focus is to help you as a family member better understand the various elements of addiction and recovery. Well, if what I just said touches a nerve, I urge you to write down this number. Are you ready? Here it is. 855-652-4325. It's toll free. 855-652-4325. That's Therapia Addiction Healing Centers. Why don't you give them a call today? All right. This week is part two of uh, the Bill Wilson story, getting to know Bill Wilson with uh, presenter Chris S. Now, as mentioned before, Chris has been uh, the chairman of our advisory board here at Take 12 Radio uh, for a very long time. Uh, and uh, he's retired from that position, but he still speaks uh, and does presentations all over the country. He is the number two most downloaded AA circuit speaker on the Internet. Uh, you're going to enjoy this. If you haven't heard part one, go to Monday's archives and uh, you can listen to part one. You can download the MP3 link and listen to it and or Bluetooth it to your to your radio in your phone or your radio in your car uh, while you're driving uh, or how, however you do do it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Monty, M-O-N-T-Y, Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. But this uh, this week is part two of the Getting to Know Bill Wilson. So without further ado, here's Chris S. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank, thank everybody for coming back and uh, those that are jo- joining us for the first time. What we're basically doing these two weeks is we're going over uh, one of the earlier drafts of Bill's story. Um, It was heavily edited after this particular writing. Uh, What what, what exists now in the book Alcoholics Anonymous was a later iteration. So uh, I said this last week, and I'll, I'll say it again. I think in historical studies, one thing that's really important or at the very least really interesting is to go back to the earliest uh, documents of whatever you're studying, the earliest strata of historical record. Uh, There's just something that's illuminating about that. Uh, That's what happens in all historical studies. Uh, People try to get uh, get as far back, uh, get the record as far back as you can. So this is a very interesting, uh, interesting story. Last week we we read uh, a little bit more than half of it, and what we were really covering, what I think, what I, what I think that the main uh, the main area of importance when you're looking at this particular story is to understand and to be able to identify with how alcoholism shows up in one's life, and Bill is just really really great at describing how alcoholism is showing up in his life. <clears throat> Many of us die from alcoholism because we misunderstand what it is. 
So many people, I, I think almost everyone that dies of alcoholism dies because they don't understand what it is, how it presents, what, 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 what are the characteristics, uh, what are the aspects of the illness, alcoholism. And no one is better than Bill Wilson at describing those. And what you're really looking at when you're looking at the first half of Bill's story is you're looking at a 12-step call. <laughs> it's been, he's basically telling his story like he would if you were, uh, if you were a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous and you were on a hospital bed and he was coming in and he was sharing with you, trying to get you hooked on the program as they would do in the earlier days. So it's a 12-step call, but it's also, it's also an expose on the first step. <clears throat> in the story, it talks again and again and again about how Bill Wilson made serious attempts to separate from alcohol and couldn't. There were periods of time when he would stay dry, but there was always, there was always um, the event that would happen in his life where he would get drunk again. Um, not every story that we know about Bill Wilson was in this, uh, this particular story, but we know that for many, many years he was absolutely desperate to separate from alcohol and could not. Uh, he could keep his memory green. He could make a firm decision. He could decide that he was not going to drink. Uh, and he, he, he prayed. He wrote his name in the, he put pledges in the Bible. He, he went to psychiatrists. He was hospitalized multiple times. And this was a guy who was serious about not drinking. I mean, as serious as you can be about not drinking. And he could not stop drinking. And his story uh, goes over this again and again. I think that's something that's very important for us to look at. Not everybody who shows up in Alcoholics Anonymous today has gone down the scale as far as Bill Wilson did. Uh, many of us who show up here uh, even, even still have some power left and can make a decision to stay away from alcohol, and it'll actually work. But the first alcoholics, the hopeless, low-bottom alcoholics, the real alcoholics that they talk about in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, those were all people who desperately wanted to stop but couldn't until they found a, a spiritual solution. So, so what we went over a lot, we went over some history, but we, we definitely went over what Bill went through um, in his drinking and he was uh, very explicit about what he was going through when he was trying to stop. And we'll pick it up. There's not page numbers on here, but we'll pick it up at the top where it says, Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. What he means by understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope, he understood that it was the first drink that would get him drunk. He understood he, could, he, could, he couldn't even take a glass of beer safely. He understood all these things. So he's leaving the hospital saying to himself, I got this now. I finally realize, I finally understand what all this means. I can't drink. And this is one of the last fallacies that he, he uh, prior, to, prior to having his, his conversion experience, that he suffers from. He truly believes that knowledge... Knowledge and a commitment is enough to keep him sober. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. But it was not, for the frightful day came and I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. It's funny. This is basically one of the stories of his last, one of his last relapses. He was playing golf this one day, and he, he's, uh, he's having a sandwich in the, the golf club after he played his uh, rounds of golf, and he's talking to the bartender there because, uh, you know, you kind of you, you eat at the bar, I guess, at this golf course. 
and he's talking to the bartender. He's going, you know, you know, I'm I'm an alcoholic. He's say, he's telling this to the bartender, and you know, for for 20 years, you know, I started drinking and it got a hold of me early on. But I'll tell you, I you know, I had unbelievable careers and I was making a lot of money, and and alcohol just destroyed me, just took me down. You know, I struggled and struggled. I've been hospitalized eight times. You know, you know, I I I was unemployable for a long, long period of time. I finally just got sober, like about two months ago and things are just starting to pick up in my life, you know, and I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. And the bartender's like, well, thank you for sharing that. You know, it's very personal and really appreciate you sharing that. And he goes, yeah, can I, can I have a double uh, bourbon? And the bartender goes to him, are you crazy? After what you just told me about what alcohol did to you, you're going you're gonna to take a drink? Are you insane? And Bill goes, I guess so. Make it a triple. <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't Bill being stupid, and it wasn't Bill changing his mind. It was how powerlessness presents. Bill wasn't even there for that decision. He didn't play a role in that. Because if you're powerless, that means you don't have any power. And if you're powerless over alcohol, that means that you're, you're not in charge of whether it goes back in your body or not. Your ego wants you to be, but you're not. It's, it's the alcohol is the power <clears throat> or spirituality and God is the power. Those are the two powers. And, and uh, those are the only two powers, uh, especially when you're getting sober. Um, after a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish, the curtain, so it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure failure during delirium tremens. Or I would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would soon give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. It was not necessary to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. <clears throat> you know, when, when the doctors at the hospital pull you in and say, okay, you know, this is, this is basically the end. You can't go on much longer like this. You're going to be dead in a very short period of time, probably. You, you might make it a year, but you're probably, going to, you're, you're probably going to die. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty serious. And the, the hospital where he was going to was a hospital called Towns Hospital, and it specialized in alcohol and drug treatment. So the, the experts in alcoholism treatment are telling Bill Wilson's wife, he ain't going to make it. He ain't going to make it. So, you know, get the will straightened out, you know, try to get a little life insurance, whatever you need to do. Now I was to plunge out into the dark, joining that endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? That career I set my heart upon, that pleasant vista was shut out forever. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. I love the way Bill Wilson describes alcoholism and describes the states of mind and emotion that we go to. You know, one of them is pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. You know, and that, I understand that experientially. And the loneliness and despair that we find in our self-pity. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm telling you, I, you know, I would drink and I would put on the sad songs and I would, cr I would cry. You know, the world just doesn't, is misunderstood me. And, you know, when I'm dead, they're going to all be sorry. And they'll, they'll probably write folk songs about the tragedy of my life. You know, I mean, it just was pathetic. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh my God. But I, but I understand. I understand what he's talking about. Quicksand underlay me in all directions. I had met my match. I, I had been overwhelmed. King alcohol was master. So again, what Bill makes very, very clear in here is the ultimate surrender, the ultimate concession 
of being powerless over alcohol. It's something that we miss today. Many of us miss it today. And that's why we, we half measure it and, you know, we share our way right out of the rooms. That's why, because we, we don't, we don't have a surrender at this kind of a depth. Trembling, I stepped from the place of broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink, and on Armistice Day, 1934, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before morning comes. In reality, this was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is so, that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen with a certain satisfaction. I reflected that there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. This guy became a continuous drinker. Many of us don't get to that point, but he, he literally was drinking around the clock in his last, last six months or so of drinking. Can you imagine having to have a bottle right by your pillow because you're going to wake up and you're going to have a problem? You're going to be sober. <laughs> You know, and you got to quick take care of that problem. you got to start drinking. And, you know, unbelievable. My musing was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. He had been committed for alcoholic insanity. So rumor had it. I wondered how he had escaped. Of course he would have dinner. Then I could openly drink with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. Is anybody in here, when you were drinking toward the end of your drinking, you were trying to recapture some of the fun and some of the good feelings that you had when you started to drink? Oh, my God. I was like in my early 30s wondering where all the high school parties went, you know, because... Because, because that was the last time it really worked for me. You know, I loved that. We'd get, we'd get drunk and then we'd go to a high school party and there would be rock music and there'd be, there'd be, somebody'd crash a car, there'd be a fight, you know, you, you know, the, you, you, you know, you'd be hitting on all the women and, you know, you didn't pay a big price. And it could be, it could be fun. And, and here I am, I'm in my 30s, wondering what happened, looking back on my high school days as the best days of my life. Now, that's kind of pathetic, you know. But there I was. Um, there was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. Another glass stirred my fancy. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. The door opened. You know, when he chartered an airplane, here's what happened. They were going to open a brand new airfield up in Vermont. And it was going to be, it was going to open on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and the mayor was going to come and do the ribbon ceremony. And then the first airplane was going to land on it. Now, what they decided to do is they chartered an airplane, got the pilot drunk, and decided they were going to be the first ones landing on it Saturday. So so there's a marching band practicing for the next day's event, and they come flying in and land, and everybody's like looking like, who the hell is this? And they pour out of the plane. Not a one of them could walk. It, it, unbelievable. Those are the type of things you look back on. You know, those are the highlights of your life. He stood there fresh-skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table. Not now, he said. Imagine an alcoholic saying no. I don't think I ever said no to a drink unless I misunderstood the question. I'm telling you. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what had gotten into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come, what's all this about, I queried. He looked straight at me. Simply but smilingly, he said, I've got religion. I was aghast. 
Now, I can understand this feeling. I can, I, I, has anybody in here ever, ever been woken up on Sunday morning by the Jehovah's Witnesses or something? You know, like, the, you know, they got the watchtower and they want to come in, you know? I mean, listen, I'm a, I was aghast, you know, back in those days. You know, today I'll probably ask them to come in and start discussing one of the, one of the New Testament books or something. But, but back in the day, you know, I did not want, you know, I was hungover and, you know, they're all in suits. It was, uh, I was a guest. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look, you know, that, cra- that crazy look. The old boy was on fire, all right, but bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer, but he, but he did no ranting. This is good old Ebby. In quite a matter-of-fact way, he related how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. The judge was going to put him away because he got really drunk and he was going to paint the house. And pigeons started landing on the gutters. And it annoyed him because, you know, they might might crap on his brand-new paint job. So he got out a shotgun and started shooting the pigeons away, you know, in a a close-knit residential neighborhood. You know, much to the neighbor's chagrin, you know, there's a drunk with shooting off a shotgun, swearing at the pigeons. So, so they, he got, they, they hooked him and they carried him to the judge and, uh, the judge was going to put him away. And a couple of guys from the Oxford group grabbed a hold of him and said, and they knew the judge. They said, listen, let's, let's give this guy a shot. Give him to us. Put him, put him in, you know, give him to us. We'll take him to New York and we're going to give him the Oxford group business. And that's what happened to Ebby. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. He had come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. What Ebby was doing was witnessing. This was something that the Oxford Group would like to do. They were basically uh, evangelizing and trying to get members for more Oxford Group members. I was shocked but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. He talked for hours Childhood memories rose before me. The sound of the preacher's voice, which one could hear on still Sundays, way over there on the hillside. The pro-offered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church fold and their doings. His insistence that the spheres really had their music. His denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen. His fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. Such recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. That war, time, day, in old Winchester Cathedral came back again. In a power greater than myself, I had always believed. I had often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are. For that means blind faith in an illogical proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists and astronomers, and even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contraindications, I had little doubt that I might purpose and uh, that that a might, mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much of precise, immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in the spirit of the universe, which knew neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. With preachers in the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked of a God personal to me who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. Here's almost the exact same thing happened to me as as happened to Bill Wilson. Uh, I had the same type of belief system that he did. I believed in the Big Bang. And I believe that there had to be something before there was something. There had to be a guiding force or intelligent design that put this whole structure together because it's just, uh, it's just, rem- our universe is just remarkable. You know, they say that 
all the matter was compressed into a tiny ball, and, and in the Big Bang, all the matter in the universe today is now spreading out, and, uh, and you, have, you have all these planets, and you have all these suns and, and universes. It's just absolutely amazing. I had to believe that there was a guiding force behind that. I, I believed that, that there was. But what I didn't believe in is an interventionary force. In, in other words, I didn't believe that God could be here and now and and offer uh, you know offer me power. I really thought I was on my own. You know, God started this whole thing running, and he don't he don't give a damn about the Schroeder boy anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? If he is a God, if he's a God, he's he's more like a cosmic Alan Funt. You know what I mean? Somebody that's just sitting up there looking down and watching. Hey, let's, let's, let's see Chris, you know, crash into the police station and on Quaaludes and ask for directions. Rawr, you know, that'll be good. Because, because I thought if there was, if there was a God who was all powerful and could intervene, you know, he was doing a, a real piss poor job with my life. So, so what I did was I started to believe that there was no force available, that there may be something after I die, but on this plane I'm on my own. And that's kind of what Bill, that's where Bill was too. So it talks about uh, when he talked of a God personal to him who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, he had a problem with that because that wasn't his experience, wasn't his current belief system. It wasn't mine either. It's become mine. You know, I came to believe, like a lot of us do, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, as, you know, working through the steps and, uh, you know, my experience in, in the rooms. But when I first showed up here, if, if I walked to the door and you, you stopped me at the door, it was my first meeting, and you said, hey, Chris, how you doing? Listen, you know, you're an alcoholic. How we all get sober, how we all put our lives back together is... Uh, is is religion is basically uh, Christianity? You know, come on in. I, I would have said, "Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I I, I misunderstood something. Uh, that won't work for me. You know, uh, but but thank you for the information and love the Watchtower. You know, uh, that's what I would have said because that's what I would have known. I would have known that religion doesn't work for me." But you all were tricky. You brought me in and you got me involved in, in the fellowship. And it was a slow process. It was, it, was an, it was a spiritual awakening of the educational variety that happens slowly over the course of time with information and with action. And I'm very, very grateful for that uh, today. <clears throat> he talks here, of Christ I conceded the certainty of a great man not too much followed by those who claimed him. His moral teaching most excellent. I had adopted those parts which seems convenient and not too difficult. The rest I discarded. The wars which had been fought, the burnings and chicanery that religious dispute had facilitated made me sick. I honestly doubted whether the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I had seen in Europe and since, the power of God in human affairs was negligible. The brotherhood of man, a grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed the boss universal, and he, so, he certainly had me. So much stuff that I relate to. My last detox, my last detox, and it took me 10 years to be able to share this because I, I really thought people would, would think I was completely insane. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I've since come to a place where I don't care if people, so, so I share it, but I was, I, I was going through the delirium tremens. I was about two and a half days into a really, really bad set of delirium tremens. I hadn't slept in about three days. I was shaking, and I, I just was not going to put booze back in my body. So, you know, I had done some things that I was just horrified about, and if, 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 my, if my heart gave out during delirium tremens, then that's just fine, you know. And I was laying back on the bed, and there was one, one kind of position I could be in where I was a little bit comfortable. And I, I remember being in this state. It, was, it wasn't quite consciousness, but it was awful close to it. It was just that, that bleak, you know, twilight zone kind of detoxing uh, uh, type of state. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden an apparition came out of the ceiling. Uh, a devil came out of the ceiling. It looked like, looked like a monitor with a big bull head and the horns, you know, right out, right out of, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, right out of Greek mythology or something. And this thing, this thing came out of the ceiling, and I swear to God, I, I recognized it as real. I could, I could feel the spit coming off of it, and it was coming down, it was coming down to eat my face. And I remember going, ah! I mean, just screaming, like, God, help me. I remember saying that because I, I didn't want this thing to eat my face. And, uh, and it disappeared. Like, like that, it disappeared. And, and I got on about my detox. And as soon as I could, uh, you know, I, I got myself to a meeting about two or, two or three days later. But I haven't had a drink since... Since that, since that, I'll tell you, there's a, there's a humility when you cry out to God like that. There's a humility when the, when the devil's going to eat your face. You know, you're pretty serious about, you know, asking God for help. Uh, but my friend sat before me. He made a point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. In effect, he had been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap uh, to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Had this power originated in him, obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and that was none at all. That floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past, here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table, straight out of the here and now. I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized. It went deeper than, than that. He was on a completely different footing. His roots grasped new soil. I mean, this is the impression that Ebby made on him. Ebby was just as bad of an alcoholic as Bill. Now, it's, it, says, it says in our literature that an alcoholic can help another alcoholic as no one else can. And before, you, uh, before you got sober, think about how many people, uh, think about the frothy emotional appeal that people would lay on you. You know, your family, your, your boss, you know, your friends. You, you really shouldn't drink. You, you, you're, you know, what's wrong with you? And, you know, you drink too much. You know, are you, are you, why do you always have to get so drunk? I mean, I would hear this all, I would hear this all the time. Uh, Ebby was that same kind of a drunk. So for him to be all cleaned up and have the lights on in his eyes and be talking about how he's putting his life back together and things are going well, Bill's paying attention. Bill's paying attention. And this is a perfect example of a 12-step call. This is what we're supposed to do when, you know, we're out there doing uh, 12-step work. Thus was I convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. It took him a little while. I mean, he, he didn't sober up the minute he talked to Ebby. He started going to the Oxford group, and he would even get drunk and go to the Oxford group and push everybody out of the way and get up to the microphone, you know, how we are. You know, and he would share, you know, half out of his mind at the Oxford group meetings. But it was, it was a short period of time. I mean, it was a, it was a short period of time when he, when he, when he sobered up for good. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. For a brief moment, I had needed and wanted God. There was a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors mostly those within myself, and so it had been ever since. It was as simple as that, how blind had I been? You know, we don't need to look for God. God's not lost. You know, we're, you know it's, it's our perception, it's our perspective that's always uh, askew. At the hospital, I was separated from king alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise then, for I showed signs of delirium when I stopped drinking. Now, in the hospital, let's pay attention to this. In the hospital, here is what Bill Wilson does. He's got Ebby and some of the other Oxford groupers, you know, coming in to visit him in Towns Hospital. There I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him to do with me as he would. It's basically a third step. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing and that without him I was lost. <clears throat> 
I ruthlessly faced my sins of omission and commission and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch. That's basically a fourth step and a six and seven step. My schoolmate visited me, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. It's really a fifth step. We made a list of people that I'd hurt or toward whom I felt resentment. An eighth step, he does, in the hospital. I expressed, my, I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. I was to test my new thinking, uh, my thinking by, by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. You know, this early Oxford group experiment, or whatever you want to call it, what it is, is it's, it's, it's a shift in, in perception. It's a shift from being mind-centered, like my mind has got to run everything. Everything's got to go through here. This is how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to move through my, my world. That's mind-centered or ego-centered to spiritually centered, which is to be seeking some guidance to try to, try to apply spiritual principles and practices in, in our lives. That's a big shift. That, that's a, that's a big shift. And when that shift starts to happen, we start to grow spiritually and we start to, uh, uh, start to have a spiritual uh, awakening. Never was I to pray for myself except in my as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might, might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. Another great thing about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is... They recognized that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of our problems. We were selfish. We were self-seeking. We were self-absorved. Uh, uh, we, we were self-conscious. We, we, every kind of self that there is, that's really what we had built the foundation of our lives on. So the antidote to that would be a life of service. The antidote to that would be compassion. And charity. So, so much of, so many of the prayers and so much of the action that they ask us to take in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has to do with readying ourselves, fitting ourselves to be of help to our fellow man and getting about that business. My friend promised that when those things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of life which answer, answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. You know, I truly believe this paragraph today, and it took me a long time. Belief in the power of God. I would have the elements of a way of life which answered all my problems. It took me a while to really believe that all of my problems will be answered by a spiritual life. All of them. And then you start thinking, what is a problem? Where does a problem originate? It's not a problem unless you make it a problem in your head. You know, you, you, see, you see people wandering around blissfully unaware that the sky is falling. You know, it's not a problem for them. It's not a problem. It, we, we, make it a, we make it a problem with the, our belief systems, with the way we think about things. So in spirituality, we look toward God for guidance. We look toward God for direction. We look, we look, uh, we look for uh, spiritual guidance and protection. And when we can do that, we're much less, much less fearful. We're much less, you know, prone to believing that the sky is falling. You know, it's just a, we see that we see the glass half full, uh, and, and we don't see it half half empty. Simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It really meant the obliteration of self. I had to quit playing God. I must I must turn in all things to the Father of Light, who presides over us all. So again, I can't keep running my own life. I can't keep making every single decision based on what's good for me. I need, I need to bring other people into the equation. I need to bring God into the equation. And when I do that, again, I start to grow spiritually.
These were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of the mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Uh, this is a spiritual awakening. Again, he, uh, they put the, uh, the spiritual appendix in the book Alcoholics Anonymous because this particular paragraph, it, it said, led people to believe that you had to have a sudden and profound spiritual awakening. It had to happen right then and there. Uh, that's not how it happens to most of us uh, because we don't all take the steps on a hospital bed, you know, for one thing. We, uh, we, we do it a little bit more piecemeal because that's kind of the way it is today. Uh, you know, I don't know any, I don't know any sponsor to tell you that God's honest truth who's going to get you up to step nine on your hospital bed today. But, but, but they did it that way back in the day. So we don't have those profound spiritual awakenings because we don't do it that fast. We have them slowly of the educational variety over a period of time after we get busy with this stuff. For a moment, I was alarmed and called my friend, the doctor, to ask if I was still sane. He listened and wondered as I talked. Remember, you know, all of a sudden, the lights came on, and Bill was in, in a hospital bed, and all of a sudden, the lights came on, and, you know, now he's, he's, he's conscious. He's, you can see some spirituality coming, coming off of him. You can tell that he is recovered. The doctor could tell he had recovered. This is the same guy that he was telling, telling his wife, Lois, that you, know, you, better, you better size up a coffin. This is the same guy. And Bill is saying, Doc, you know, uh, the, the wind the wind of the spirit blew up my butt a little while ago. You know, I, I mean, I feel different. You know, I, you know am I crazy? Is this, is, this, is, this, is this the hallucinations? Does this have to do with my detox? And, and, and basically what the doctor said was, no, Bill, no, hang on to this. Whatever you got, hang on to it, man. The lights are on. You hang on to this because this is exactly what you need to be able to survive alcoholism, this shift in personality and perception. He finally shook his head saying, something has happened to you that I don't understand, but you better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. The good doctor now sees many men have such experiences. He knows they are real. While I lay in the hospital, the thought came uh, that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given to me. Right here, this is the most important sentence in the book Alcoholics Anonymous or in Bill's story or wherever in any recovery literature. In the Osher group, alcoholics would wander into the Osher group for the coffee and donuts and if they got busy with the Oxford Group stuff, they would sober up. And they'd stay sober about as long as they had real intense activity with the Oxford Group. But rarely did they decide to go help other people and to write a book and start a fellowship. Bill Wilson, on his hospital bed, while he probably was still stinking of bathtub gin, decided that he was going to dedicate the rest of his life to helping alcoholics who needed to find a spiritual answer and recover from this illness. And he decided this on a hospital bed, and he hung on to it. That's really the amazing thing. A lot of us have had great motives. A lot of us have had great ideas about, you know, how often, how often did, did, did the importance of that particular idea diminish? You know, as it became inconvenient, you know. Uh, we're here because of this sentence. Perhaps I could help some of them. They in turn might work with others. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of my demonstrating these principles in all my affairs, living a spiritual life. Particularly, it was imperative to work with others as he'd work with me. Faith without works was dead, he said. In the early days, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm just listening to a book on tape, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, and they're talking about Cleveland. Now, now, what happened was they got some publicity in Cleveland, the Liberty, the Liberty article or something, and all of a sudden, 
a group in Cleveland that had about 30 people had 200 the next day. And hundreds of letters and hundreds of phone calls and hundreds of referrals from around the country. And these AAs, Clarence and these AAs, what they did, because they not many of them had any jobs, they'd literally work from 7 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night going around seeing prospects. Just all day, all day long. They'd put in 18, 20-hour days just doing 12-step calls on alcoholics all over the place, just driving all around. New people, people who had been sober less than a week, were given five people a night to go see. You've got to go to five different houses and, and pitch five different people. That's, what, that's your job for tonight. And there were alcoholics that were doing it, you know, on their own. You know, go, go knock on doors. What? You know, I can't, I can't imagine. They, they had a service ethic back then. They had a go carry the message ethic back then that is just, it's unheard of in today's, today's AA. And, and I think that's why we've got, uh, our, our recovery rates are lower than they were back in the day. Because it's not about what you know, it's about what you do that, that, that is going to mean the difference between success and failure, failure for you. Um. How appallingly true for the alcoholic, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. So the next time somebody comes back into one of your closed-minded discussion meetings that you go to, and, and they raise their hand and they say, I'm coming back, and they start to tell you why they went back out, because she left or she stayed or uh, I got the job, or, or you know, I, I lost the job, or, you know, whatever dumb reason they're going to try to attach to why they drank, uh, remind them that really what happens is you drink because you fail to perfect and enlarge your spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. That's why you drink. It's your, it's every single time if you're an alcoholic, it's your failure to obey spiritual principles is why we drink. You can, you, can, you can paint it whatever color you want. That's why an alcoholic drinks. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. If he did, and if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. Uh, with us, it is just like that. My wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution of their problems. It was fortunate for my old business association. Associates remained skeptical for a year and a half, during which time I found little work. I was not too well at the time, and I was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink. You know, Bill had what, what Bill would be absolutely and 100% uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder if he, if he was around today. There would be times when he could not get out of bed. He would pull the covers over his head and he just, I ain't getting out. You know, has anybody in here ever felt like that? I ain't, I ain't getting out. I'm not getting up. You know, I'm, you know, leave me alone. And he would do that. A, a lot of the 12 and 12 was written, you know, while he had the covers pulled over his head. I mean, I mean, but the great thing was this, this guy was able to stay, this guy was able to stay sober. This sometimes nearly drove me to drink. I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would just save the day. Truly, when he did get, when he did get down in the dumps, he'd go down to town's hospital and he'd start telling an alcoholic who's, you know, in four point restraints his story. Many times I have gone to my old hospital, uh, feeling terrible. On talking to a man there, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It is a design for living that works in the tough spots. Truly, that is what the AA program is. It's a design for living. You know, um, I'm, I come from a, an intellectual family. I, I come from a, a family that's way, really way over-educated past their intelligence level. It's, it's they're, 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 they're PhDs, and, you know, and... Uh, my brother's a Ph.D. in economics. My sister's a Ph.D. in medieval, medieval history. I'm a Ph.D. in pretty heavy drinking is really what, what, what I am. And uh, that's about it. But, uh, but, but I come from a, a really, really, uh, really, really uh, smart family. And I wanted to figure this AA stuff out. I, I did. Give me the book. Give, give me the cliff notes. Give me, you know, to, you know give it, to, tell me, give me the mechanics of this thing. And I'll figure it out. 
I'll find out whatever secret you guys have to not drinking, and I'll be on my way, thank you. You know, that's really what I thought. I've, I've come to understand over the years that this is more about aligning my will with how I would believe God's will would be. It has a lot to do with how I spend my day. It has a lot to do with if the phone rings, do I, and, and I think it's some knucklehead newcomer that wants a ride from the hatch, you know, do I, do I, do I let it go to voicemail or do I answer it? You know, I can think, and there's that knucklehead calling me up who wants a ride from the hatch, god damn it. I can think that, but you know what I have to do? I have to pick it up, and I have to say, seven o'clock? You know, I, I, I mean, those, those, that's how you have to align the way you move through your life. The people who don't make it in Alcoholics Anonymous are the people who don't put in the time and the effort. You know, you, you can be stupid and get this program, and you can be smart and not get it. It has to do with, it has more to do with where your feet are than where your mouth and your mind are. That's why a sponsor, a, a sponsor, like when I was brand new, I would come up to my sponsor, Phil, and I'd go, Phil, oh my God! You wouldn't believe. You know, they're, they're coming after me. They found me after all this. They're coming. I'm going to break my knees. They're going to break my knees. I'm just, I'm just crazy. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? And, he, and he, would, he would do what a good sponsor does. He would go, <laughs> Chris, here's what I want you to do. I want you, I want you to, when you come home from work today, I want you to, to take a quick little nap. And then I want you to eat some food, and then I want you to go to the AA meeting tonight. And then after the AA meeting, there's some people that go out to the diner. I want you to go out to the diner. And then when you get home tonight, I want you to thank, get down on your knees and thank God for helping to keep you sober for one for that day. And I would be... <laughs> Should I tell it to you again slower? What the hell does that have to do with they're going to come and break my knees? <laughs> Phil understood that the people who were going to come and break my knees were, were, were like a symptom of the illness. And he was trying to treat the root cause, which was my spiritual condition. He knew that if he helped protect me against the people, that that was going to be a waste of his time and mine. But he knew that if he kept convincing me to go to where I can be exposed to the power, to the solution, I was going to eventually recover from alcoholism. And then I wouldn't have any problems anymore. One of the things that I've learned as a sponsor and as a spiritual advisor is to not be a drama coach. Oh, my God, you know how much time I wasted being a drama coach for people. You know, they just, they, they, they call you up and they want to give you 45 minutes of my life is blown up. And then when you start to su- make some suggestions to them, they can't get off the phone fast enough. I mean, you know, and, and I, I mean, I used to do that. I mean, that's crazy. What that is, is you're trying to help somebody manage an unmanageable life. You know, that's as insane as trying to manage it, you know. If you're trying to help somebody manage an unmanageable life, the life needs to be managed spiritually. We don't strategically manage it, you know. So now, you know what happens when somebody calls me up and goes, Chris, you, know, you wouldn't believe it. As all as my life's blown up. The cops, you know, lawyers, what should I do? Well, what I'd like you to do is when you get home from work today... <laughs> I'd like you to go to a meeting, you know, because, you know, we, we work out our, we work out our problems on the spiritual plane. That's what we do. We've commenced to make many fast friends and a fellowship has grown up among us, which is a wonderful thing to feel apart. The joy of living we really have, even under pressure and difficulty. I gotta tell you, I, you know, I have gone, in the last two or three years, I have gone through a divorce. I've gone through near bankruptcy. I've gone, I, I, I lost my mother. I mean, I, you know, in the last couple of years, just, I could, I, could make, I could make you cry if I wanted to about how tough my life has been the last couple of years. 
But you want to know the truth? It wasn't tough. It was, it was one, one day at a time. It was fine. It was fine. Do I miss my mother? Of course I do. But I got, I got to tell you, her three children were holding her hand as she went into the next room. You know, it couldn't have been better. Uh, I learned so much going broke. I, I got involved, I got involved with, uh, with professional addiction and alcoholism treatment stuff and all these different startups and I met all these people. I've got, I've got a Rolodex worth a million dollars now going broke. And the divorce, I got out of hell and I went to heaven. You understand? It was, it was, it was, it was that, you know, it was that dramatic. People that, people that know me go, Chris, I've never seen you so happy. Now, I could easily, I could easily go to, go, go, go to the loony noony and raise my hand and say, oh, my divorce, my divorce, my divorce, my divorce, my divorce. You know, if you weren't here last week, you know, let me tell you where you, let me update you on my divorce, my divorce, my divorce. Will you please? You know, that, there's nothing that's a bigger waste of time than something like that. We work out our, we, you know, we work out our problems on the spiritual plane. Alcoholics Anonymous is not group therapy. It's not self-help. It's not a dumping ground. What it is is it's a support fellowship so that we can each encourage each other one more day to keep practicing these spiritual principles in our lives. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is. I've seen men come out of the asylums and resume a, right, a vital place in the lives of their families and communities. Business and professional people have regained their standing. There is scarcely any form of human misadventure and misery which has not been overcome among us. In a western city in its environs, uh, there are 60 of us and our families. We often meet informally in our houses so that newcomers may find what they seek. Gatherings of, 10, 10, of 20 to 60 are common. We are growing in numbers and power. An alcoholics in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with them are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. He could not or would not see what we had beheld. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it. I suppose some would be shocked at our seemingly worldness and levity. But just underneath, uh, one finds a deadly earnestness. God has to work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. You know, we do have a lot of, a lot of fun here. Yeah, you know, every once in a while, uh, uh, a, a normal person will wander into one of our meetings and, you know, they're here, they'll hear somebody telling their story. Yeah, you know, I, I got really dry and I backed over a nun, you know, and the whole place is like, yeah, <laughs> and a normal person's like, yeah, they're, they're like, why are they laughing? You know, we, you know, it's because we, we understand that we really shouldn't take ourselves seriously. Do we take alcoholism seriously? You're damn right. Do we take Alcoholics Anonymous and, and practicing spiritual principles in our lives seriously? We better. Uh, but, but we can't take ourselves seriously. We're, we're meatheads most of the time. You know what I mean? Like, look at some of the stuff you've done. In the past, you know, if they, if they were ever, if you were ever to run for political office, think about, think about what they could dig up on you. You know what I mean? Oh, most of us feel we need to look no further for utopia, nor even for heaven. We have it with us on this good old earth right here and now. Each day, that simple talk in my kitchen multiplies itself in widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. Um, thank you for offering me the opportunity to, to do this. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks. Wow. I just appreciate Chris so very much. Thank you, my brother, for uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation on uh, on Bill Wilson and getting to know him and so much practical application. Uh, folks, I, I really pray that you go back and listen to this show again. Share it with somebody else. Uh, download it, make it a, a, a copy of it on CD, share it with your friends in the meetings. Um, this, this information is so vital. All right. Until our next broadcast, everyone, 
I wish you a wonderful continued new year all through the month of January. And I'm wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye-bye now. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. 